Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious today as I come to you from our Cape Canaveral Gallery here at the American Space Museum. We've got a show today that's going to focus on Apollo 7, the critical return to flight of America's astronauts after the Apollo 1 fire and the end of the the uh, very successful Gemini two-man mission. We had the Apollo 1 fire January 27th, 1967, and lost Gus Grissom, Roger Chaffee, and Ed White. And it was up to three astronauts to bring us back to the prominence of of leading the moon race against Russia. And in October 11th, 1968, the Saturn, 5, Saturn 1B rocket uh, launched Wally Schirra, Walt Cunningham, and Don Isley to on a perfect, the, the mission was called 101% perfect 10 day, a very long mission in America's new spaceship, the maiden flight of the Apollo 1 Block 2, they called it, spacecraft. Uh, built by Rockwell, it was CM number 101, and we're going to talk a little. Bit, we're going to talk a lot about that today, and see where CM 101 rests today, and uh, uh, and have and also going to visit a museum where the Apollo 7 command module is. Uh, you can go see it today, I'm sure, if you got time to get there. Uh, and we're going to check out another museum uh, that I was at a year ago, just for fun. All on today's Stay Curious program, and I want to thank Selvin Trotter for pinch hitting for Marty, who took a personal day off today. Uh, Selvin, we're chugging along here with episode number 907 uh, of Stay Curious in our four years, and we're glad to have you join us today. So, Selvin, let me know if there's any comments that uh, you need to make or anybody chiming in there or if, if something's going uh, awry there, okay? So uh, we want to remind everybody that we're going to have a Galaxy of Giving fundraiser uh, in, uh, oh, I hit, uh, Selvin, you hit the, I hit that and then image. Something's going wacky there. Yep, I'll put it up there. There you go. Galaxy of Giving, November 1st. We're going to start uh, asking for your tax-deductible donations on various levels so we can preserve this beautiful Cape Canaveral Gallery. This, I think, is the most extensive collection of Cape Canaveral launch equipment, some of it from Pad 14 that launched the Gemini, some from 36 that launched over 300 Atlas V or Atlas rockets, Atlas II and III. Uh, I love over here is uh, that is a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck, Selvin, mm -hmm. that I call the, the, an external hard drive of the 60s mm -hmm. there. So all that lights up. We have a little rocket launch show there to sh show visitors. Uh, this room was used in a country music video by Mitchell Tenpenny called We Got History. Check that out. Mitchell was right above my head there. They simulated like he was in a rocket ship with the lights off and the lights going on. Uh, so very, one of the favorite uh, B-roll places for any of the videographers or photographers that come in here. This is what we're talking about, preserving this heritage of the American space program. This is the delivery room of America's space age right here in our museum. And so just once again, Galaxy of Giving time will be uh, starting November 1st. All right, Selvin, let's uh, look at, wait, let me go here. We have a, not an emergency, but on the International Space Station, this module of Russia called Nokia, their science module, it's only been up there about less than three years, sprung a leak in its uh, uh, coolant uh, heat dissipating system, the radiators, of course. Radiators are up above the top there. Now, Selvin, when I try to make this full, it goes blank, but then I hit image. And it's full, so let me do that. But okay. I don't know uh, what's going on there, but that works. Apparently, they did a space station uh, spacewalk right above our name up there. Take that logo off there. And uh, there's a leak up there. Uh, of course, uh, instrumentation showed it. NASA said, uh, would somebody, uh, flight controls at Johnson Space Center in Houston, radioed the U.S. space station just after 1 p.m., Eastern Daylight Time, uh, Monday, today, 
telling them we're seeing flakes outside, presumably frozen coolant, asking for someone to float into the multi-window cupola and get a better look. And that is just what astronaut Jasmine Mogali did. She's the commander of the Crew-7 up there. Yeah, there's a leak coming from the radiator, she said. So it's not threatening the primary radiator of Nauka, N-A-U-K-A, that means science in Russian, is working normally, providing cooling to the module. No impacts to the crew or space station operations. Well, two cosmonauts are gearing up for uh, um, a spacewalk like Thursday. Uh, Laura O'Hara and uh, ESA astronaut Andreas Morgensen. So they're already Tuesday planning for that spacewalk. So you can't have coolant particles stuck to a spacesuit and go inside the space station. That could pose a threat. Uh, I'm reading from the updated story by Bill Harwood of CBS News. Thank you, Bill Harwood, for being part of Stay Curious last Thursday when he was a wonderful guest on our show. This is the third leak in, this, in less than a year in December. This leak on Soyuz MS-22 prohibited the astronauts from coming up uh, Coming back uh, on a six-month routine, uh, Frank Rubio and two cosmonauts had to stay up there for over a year. However, this capsule did make it back safely, uncrewed, but they didn't put a crew in there just, just in case. So we will keep our eye on this situation and let you know if there's any update on it tomorrow. Tomorrow, by the way, we're going to have uh, as our guest uh, Terry White, who's going to talk about the... Um, Hurricane preparations at Kennedy Space Center. He's been through as manager of the orbital processing facility, the three buildings or garages of the space shuttle. Terry White, looking forward to your program tomorrow and stay curious. Oh, happy birthday to this man, John Grunstra, 65 years old, enrolled in, enrolling in Medicare. There's my happy birthday banner for him there with the astronaut pin. <clears throat> Grunstra, let me make that a full image there. Grunstra is one of the well-known astronauts that tied into the Hubble Space Telescope. After all, he did three of the five upgrade missions to the Hubble, including the last uh, two. Uh, there he is outside the space station. Born in Chicago, Illinois. Where's my my glasses at? Are they around my neck? or? Oh, they're on, on the ground here. Let me get that. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Uh, Grunstra, born in Chicago, Illinois, October 10th, 1958. We wish him happy senior life to you, sir. There he is getting ready for an EVA. Uh, this is a five-time shuttle flyer, 58 days in space, eight spacewalks totaling 58 hours. That's kind of cool. His dad... Tony Grun Grunsfeld was a distinguished Chicago architect. Uh, and he was the grandson of architect Ernest Grunsfeld, who built the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Very famous planetarium. Uh, uh, I'd love to see that. I never have. Uh, so he has that astronomy in his, his blood uh, all his life. He attended Massachusetts Institute of Technology, getting his bachelor's in physics. He went to the University of Chicago, uh, got a master's in physics and doctor in philosophy uh, of, in physics. So uh, uh, and but this is what's so cool about him. Read up on him. Uh, he, he's really a, a great guy. I would love to meet him. But do all of you remember the uh, national public radio show called uh, Car Talk uh, with Tom and Ray Mariazzi? And uh, Ray passed away, and or Tom passed away, I think, and then Ray's kind of doing, still doing some ads. Well, it was a fun, hilarious show about car repairs on a, on a, a national public radio every Saturday morning. Well, he called them up. He placed a phone call to NPR's auto repair car show called Car Talk, and he complained about his government Rockwell van's performance. He said this Rockwell van runs very loud and rough for about two minutes, quiet for another six and a half, and then the engine would quit. And this created some consternation among Tom and Ray Mariachi, okay? And they 
they bit it hook, line, and sinker until they realized the van in question was, in fact, the space shuttle, okay? Very loud, rough for two minutes, quiet for another six and a half, then the engine just won't start anymore. So that's a pretty good joke there. And he called them again, uh, 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 talking about the uh, strip and 10 millimeter bolts on the Hubble due to improper assembly. So uh, quite a character, John Grunsfeld. I've actually seen him at the Astronaut Hall of Fame. Uh, of course, I'm not going to approach a gentleman there at that, but uh, he's an astronaut that I look up to, one of our heroes for what he's done to repair that Hubble telescope or keep it upgraded. All right, let's segue into the Apollo 7 tribute. I can't talk about that without remembering our Apollo 1 heroes for a minute. This is the beautiful tribute that they have out at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, right at the end of the Saturn V rocket, uh, just beyond the lunar module that they put on the ground. And there's the emblem. And you go behind this, and you see three cases of each of the astronauts' possessions. A little, a little story for 30 minutes hides those from you in a cool way, and then it dissolves. And there they are. And then you see the, the infamous uh, three, three-layered door that they couldn't get open in time before they perished. And on January 27th, 1967. And this Apollo mission was all about restoring the faith in America's moon race with Russia. All that money that had been expended, the Saturn V rockets being built, uh, and Sherrall, Isley, and Cunningham were put to the task of everything had to go right. There was no lunar module. There was just this Rockwell command module number 101. And everything was perfect. In fact, to cut to the chase, one of the uh, Sam uh, uh, Phillips, the Apollo program manager, said, Apollo 7 goes into my book as a perfect mission. We accomplished 101% of our objectives. But it was not without some controversy. And you space geeks know that this group of crew never flew again. Of course, Shara, the only astronaut to fly Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, all right, uh, and Mercury's uh, six is uh, his uh, three orbits, uh, repeating, or six orbits, I mean, um, is an, an October mission also. Well, let's look a little bit about the, um, let me go forward here, there's the breakfast. Uh, the first man on the left is James Webb. He was the administrator for NASA, and the James Webb Telescope is named after that gentleman who was truly a politician, and that's what the, the suits of NASA had to be, were going up to Capitol Hill and saying, look, uh, the Apollo 7, the Apollo 1 fire uh, is going to cost uh, this, this amount of millions of dollars to get us back on track. And I mean, it was a tough job. Uh, there you've got uh, to the left of him is... Uh, a, Cunningham, and then you've got Deke Slayton in the blue, and that's Wally Shara and Don Isley in the blue shirt beside him there. Uh, not sure who's standing up. You see there's cameras going on. Uh, quite an interesting job to have cameras thrust in you all the time, even when you're eating steak and eggs before you're getting on a, a, a giant rocket bomb and, and testing out a new spacecraft that no one ever had before. Um, a lot of a lot of the uh, so some of the what happened on this flight that uh, was the controversy was <clears throat> the guys got colds they caught a cold and they were kind of grumpy and they wanted everything to go right. In fact, let me find my notes here. That um, Isley said that uh, uh, they were. They're very preoccupied with what they had to do. I, I usually said it really good there that um, uh, at times they were, I'll find that here in a minute. Um, oh, here we go. Isley said, we were insolent, high-handed, and Machiavellian at times. Call it paranoia. Call it smart. It got the job done. We had a great flight. All right. And Krantz, well, I'll, I'll tell you about those here in a minute. That what Krantz says. I'll, I'll give you some comments of the, the back talk that they gave uh, NASA leaders there. 
But before we get there, before they got on this rocket ship, Wally Shara demanded that a man be put back on the pad in charge of the White Room, and that be that being the their old friend from Gemini and Mercury days, Gunter Vent. There's the three guys lining up for like a football attack on the on the world there. Uh, talk about Gunter here in a minute. Uh, that is, uh, uh, of course, uh, Cunningham is still alive. He's 91 years old. Isley died uh, way too young uh, in his late 60s, I think. And uh, Wally Schrau lived to a ripe old age of 88. And he really, really got the fruits of his fame. Uh, he was the sidekick of uh, Walt, uh, two Walters, Walter Cronkite and Wally Schra there talking about the Apollo 11 landing. Uh, he was a very visible person and attended a lot of things at the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. Here's a very rare picture of them. Wait a minute, we don't have the Saturn V built yet. They don't have it built there. That's the Saturn 1B. All right, that's the Saturn 1B right there uh, that they're standing in front of. A little shorter, just one less. Uh, second stage is missing there. It's actually the third stage of the whole thing. I love the Ascots, love Walt Cunningham, the best flat top in the astronaut corps there. And uh, that's Don Isley on the left, E-I-S-L-E-E, uh, e, and that's uh, E-I-S-E-L-E. -E. And thank you, Hazel Banks, who was one of the Apollo secretaries, saying that it's pronounced Isley. There is the Pad Fuhrer, Gunter Vent, and Gunter Vent, W. E N D T uh, had his job with McDonald uh, for the Mercury and Gemini flights to take over the White Room, make sure everything was perfect with the spacecraft. The astronauts did not want nothing messed with, uh, and of course there was a lot of gotchas between the astronauts putting uh, uh, gag gifts and stuff in there. But uh, so when they segued uh, to uh, North American building the Apollo command module during the Apollo 1 fire, Bent was not the pad leader, all right? So adamant was Shara in his desire to have Gunter Vent put back as the pad leader for his Apollo flight that he got the North American people. He got uh, First, he got McDonald to let Vent go so North American could hire him and then changed his shift from midnight to day so he could be the pad leader for Apollo 7. And Gunter Vent remained the pad leader for the entire program. And this is why. Cutting up there with John Glenn, break, he knew when to break the tension, and he knew when to be serious and put the game face on. And when you're up there in that white room, there's a lot of tension uh, and a lot of people saying a lot of prayers. And Gunter Vent up there was, was the perfect guy to relieve all that tension. There there he is talking to Wally about, looks like they're looking at a schematic of the uh, uh, controls there, saying maybe something where we set a switch for you there. That was his Gemini 6 flight, 6A, quite possibly. And there's Gunter in the days when he was a familiar face at events for the American Space Museum. His book is really a good one, The Unbroken Chain. Uh, we've got tribute to him in our Mercury Gemini gallery, and he always signed it there, pad leader. And uh, a, a great uh, uh, guy that I wish I could have had the pleasure to know, but he was a fixture on Space Coast for many, many years after his retirement. And the good luck, kind of the rabbit's foot of the astronauts. Uh, so it was all about Wally getting him back there, and uh, uh, everything was fine ever since. Well... Some of the high highlights of Apollo 7 and its 10-day flight were testing the television for the first live TV. Well, at one particular time, uh, they had a bunch of burns scheduled. They were, they were putting the spacecraft through all kinds of hypothetical situations, of uh, phantom docking, uh, bringing them to a point in space and altitude and so forth uh, that uh, aviators can understand. Well, Wally wrote that they are supposed to do a TV show, and he said it will be delayed without further discussion until after the rendezvous. 
in Shira, and that was very insolent to, to tell uh, to say it like that to Mission Control. We're not going to do it now. We're going to do it later. I don't care if it's at eight o'clock and Ed Sullivan or whatever was waiting for us to talk to the country. We are doing a rendezvous. And uh, Shira later wrote, "We we'd resist anything that interfered with our main mission objectives." On this particularly Saturday morning, a TV program clearly interfered. And Isley agreed in his memoirs. We were preoccupied with preparations for that critical exercise and didn't want to divert our attention with what seemed to be trivialities at the time. Evidently, the Earth people felt differently. There was a real stink about the hot headed, uh, uh, recalcitrant Apollo 7 crew who wouldn't take orders. And that was the rumor was they wouldn't, they didn't take orders. And that's not true. They stuck to their orders, their mission orders in their flight manual uh so you know uh they gave in to shira but the 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 commander's attitude clearly surprised flight controllers as wally was known to be a jovial uh uh jokester him and alan shepherd played all kinds of gotchas on all of them well there's the transmission finally and Wally put up there a card, keep those cards and letters coming in, folks. Uh, and that's a reference to the U.S. mail system, folks. Those of you that haven't mailed a letter or a card in a while, okay. Um, so let's see, what's the next slide after this one? There's the crew uh, after the mission. Ten-day mission now. This is a long mission in space. Uh, and the only needed us uh, three days to go to the moon, three days back one day on the surface of the moon, so they clearly built in a big margin of safety in that command module that worked flawlessly for all the Apollo missions afterwards. Well, none of the Apollo 7 crew members flew again. Here's, here's some of the, the other talk that, that, that they went through there. Um, where, is, where is that one little... Oh, I have it right here. Uh, all right. Shara told Mission Control after having to make repeated firings of the reaction control system to keep the spacecraft stable during a test. Uh, he was annoyed at all the firings he had to do. He said, quote, I wish you would find out the idiot's name who thought up this test. I want to find out, uh, and I want to talk to him personally when I get back down. <laughs> and then Isley joined in and said, while you're at it, find out who dreamed up P-22 Horizon Test. That's a beauty also. So uh, they were quite annoyed at the engineers giving them things that they thought was uh, uh, unnecessary and a waste of time. But after the mission, they all got the Exceptional Service Medal. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson, held a ceremony at LBJ Ranch to give him uh, more medals. He gave them the, they got the highest honor, Distinguished Service Medal. Uh, from uh, NASA Administrator James Webb, who had recently retired. Webb had to retire after the November 1968 election when the Republican administration took over under Richard Nixon. So, um, uh, but Johnson uh, held a ceremony at the LBJ Ranch just before him. I, I said that the Kennedy administration and the Johnson, of course. Uh, uh, and they were all there in December, the White House crew. So, despite the difficulties, uh, uh, everyone really lauded the, the, that they, they that outside of their snippiness and, and snide remarks about things that they didn't want to do, they, uh, it was a tremendously successful mission. And, uh, and they proved that this spacecraft was the most reliable that we'd ever sent to space and that's what we wanted to hear and there's a successful landing and uh, uh you see the astronauts getting in there of course they landed on the water and, and uh, that's what amazes me it also floated the command module you know there was no uh nickname for this command module because it was apollo 7 there was no other spacecraft in space just like on apollo 8 they didn't have a nickname of snoopy brown or Aquarius or uh, Columbia, whatever, because there's just one vehicle to deal with. So, uh, great mission, CSM-101, quite a, an amazing spacecraft. Um, 
uh, Chris, uh, let's see, uh, Gene Krantz said in 1998, looking back uh, with a longer perspective, Wally Schwara really wasn't on us as bad as it seemed at the time. Bottom line was, even with a grumpy commander, we got the job done as a team. <laughs> so, uh, got a lot of good stories. There's a, uh, Wally wrote a good book called Shiraz Space. Uh, and I don't think he really, he got detailed into that, that uh, mess there. And it's true. The bottom line is that they really did have a great mission. They were a very coherent team. They probably should have flown together on a moon mission together. Uh, Cunningham, uh, uh, let's see what happened to the crew. Uh, Isley's career may have been affected by becoming the first active astronaut to get divorced. Okay, that was kind of a biggie back then. Uh, and followed by a quick remarriage. So that kind of broke the stereotype of the, the uh, cookie cutter uh, astronaut with the wife and two kids and all that. Uh, Cunningham was made the leader of the astronaut Skylab division, uh, and he wanted to be the commander of the uh, first Skylab crew, but it went to Pete Conrad, so he uh, was offered backup commander of that, but he resigned. So, um, so anyway, quite an interesting uh, Apollo 7, and we're going to talk a little bit about it now from the standpoint of... Uh, Almost 11 days in space. I really find that amazing uh, to do a maiden flight of such a critical mission and not want three or five days uh, to do it a, a really long time. But to go see the spacecraft, uh, well, to learn about colds, if you have a cold, take some Actifid, okay? So says Wally Shira. It was they did have stuffy colds. They had head colds. They wanted to take their helmets off because they had head colds so during reentry. That was another insubordination thing, kind of that that Wally did was he wanted permission to do that because they're afraid that uh, uh, they would have to hold their nose for their ears would drums would pop from having their colds. So uh, they couldn't hold their nose with the space helmet on. And he said he was going to do it anyway. Uh, when the Chris Kraft, the flight director, said, don't do it. And, uh, you know, Wally said, you're not up here. We are, you know, and, and we're going to do it. So uh, unclear if they did or didn't. There weren't any photographs of that. So ActiFed, don't think that's around today. But I know what's around today is their spacecraft. And you can see that spacecraft right here at the, uh, the, the Frontiers of Flight Museum. As Marty walks in. Hey, Marty Winkle, how you doing? Good, Mark. Good to see you today. We're uh, we just got done with Apollo Seven, and you're looking at the only I spacecraft period that you could touch. I couldn't believe it when I went visited out there about five years ago. This is the Frontier of Flight Museum uh, at uh, Love Field in Dallas, Texas. All right, and not too far from downtown area where President Kennedy was assassinated, and that's where Air Force One was at Love Field. Well, I'm going to give them a little bit of love and love and love field there and tell you that in 1963, a man named George Hathaway, a noted aviation historian and publisher of the flight of, of the magazine called Flight Magazine, donated his enormous collection of artifacts to the University of Texas. His history of aviation collection was later moved from Austin, Texas, to University of Texas at Dallas in the late 70s. Well, in 1988, Mr. Hathaway forged an agreement with a group of Dallas leaders to make possible to display his artifacts off campus. And with the leadership of these people here, I believe I have a picture, that's Mr. Hathaway up at the top, and the people at the lower left are uh, Senator K. Bailey Hutchinson, William Bill Cooper, and Jan Calmer of the Frontiers of Flight Museum was formed with these three, three, three people there in 1988 became a nonprofit. City of, da of Dallas agreed to provide office space at the main terminal for Love Field in 1990. The thing took off. Today it's a 100,000 square foot facility. You see there's a, a Southwest airline, looks like it crashed into it. As you approach it there, that catches your attention. Uh, opened in June 2004. It's got two climate controlled hangar-like buildings. 
uh, and I fell in love with this place. Uh, one, it's got the, you can touch the spacecraft. There's the outside of it when they were celebrating Apollo 7's 50th anniversary. So I was there in 2018, five years ago. There is the spacecraft uh, completely open. I was uh, out at the Kennedy Space Center and saw Apollo 14 over the weekend. And they used to have a velvet rope around it. Now they've got something like this, and but you cannot touch it. But clearly when I saw that hatch open, there's a guy touching it right there reaching down as I'm up a, a level above looking down at this beautiful uh, 53 three year, years old now. But there is a, a uh, stairs to go up to it. You see the railing I, could, I held on to, plexiglass. So you look into the command module, and I saw the docent over there, and I said, uh, I can touch this? The, the hand, the door, he says, yeah, yeah, touch it all you want. So you know I did. Okay, <laughs> there's my hand on it there. Uh, so uh, I think it's the only uh, American spacecraft that you can touch. Uh, and I, I uh, stick to that. So pretty cool. Uh, you know, uh, and, you know, I'm just going to make this political com or this personal comment. The Russian Soyuz space station is over 40 years old. And it, if we had just kept re remodeling this, and, and kept uh, it, it the way it is. Uh, look what we got now, Selvin. The same spacecraft, a gumdrop. All right, that's what Blue Origin, that's what uh, SpaceX has got. That's what the, the Boeing is, Starliner. That's what the Orion spacecraft is, the same gumdrop that 50 years ago was designed for the Apollo spacecraft. And if this had just kept in production line, all right, we may we may not have lost some astronauts that we did uh, like the uh, Apollo like the STS seven crew, uh, uh, you know, uh, if we'd have known what happened. So, just saying, one little kind of not cheesy but very simple effective thing at this museum was every day in space they had a poster up there of what the guys ate. That that's there the meals that each three of them ate. I thought that was neat. And uh, uh, a lot of shrimp cocktail up there for Wally. And so uh, just a very interesting display there. Here's an overhead look uh, at this beautiful Frontiers of Flight Museum in Dallas, Texas. I can't wait to go see it again. I really, really was uh, enamored with it. And they have a moon rock from Apollo 15, about the size of your thumb there. A uh, little black uh, moon rock there. And then they had the Braniff. This was the headquarters in Dallas for the uh, Concorde, in Braniff's uh, Concorde uh, supersonic uh, aircraft there. And this was the steward and steward, or the steward on the right, and stewardess's outfits that they wore on the Concorde. So guess which one was 1968? There. Yep, that fuchsia-looking uh, mini skirt there, uh, center right next to the guy in the blue. Very fashionable they were. Every year... Braniff had uh, one of the designers, one of the courtiers of, of high fashion uh, uh, make their, uh, uh, their, their suits and uh, clothes for their stewardesses there. So now you know. Well, I'm going to segue from that to a year ago. Uh, I visited another one of my very favorite places. This is top five of all the museums in the world. And that, of course, would be the fabulous Neil Armstrong Museum in Wapakoneta, Ohio. Uh, I, Interstate 75 is just on the other side of the moon dome. This is actually mostly underground. That's kind of cool about it. I bet they have a low uh, electricity bill there. Uh, very beautiful uh, outside, green spans everywhere. They do all kinds. Of, I saw one, one year they had uh, hundreds of American flags out here in this nice field. They have Niels and David Scott's Gemini 8 spacecraft there that made the emergency landing uh, after the thruster stuck on there. And uh, I found a way to put me in a moon suit there by this moon suit or his reflection of, of, uh, uh, of me in, over a moon suit there. And they've got one of the largest moon rocks I've seen. That moon rock... Uh, I'm trying to make an analogy of it. It's not walnut size. It's almost uh, the size of a. Uh, it's the size of, of a, a ping pong ball. 
bit on a ping pong ball, almost a tennis ball. Nice, nice moon rock there. Uh, Selvin, remember when the price of eggs was five dollars a, a dozen? They replaced the moon rock with an egg uh, there at the uh, on a joke, and uh, that was kind of a wild picture where I'm trying to grab the moon rock in there. And again, the docent giving a great demonstration and talk about the uh, uh, here at the Neil Armstrong Museum. And you bet I told him we have Neil's handprints. You may have his spaceship, but we've got these handprints here at our museum. Uh, these were something odd that I've never heard about. These were little straps that they had on the floor that they could tie their boots down and uh, if they wanted to. Not known if they really used that or not. Have to talk to Marty about that if he remembers any kind of thing on the floor for that. And then that, that's, this is one of the, the showcases they had. That is a command module in the back from the 60s. We have that in our museum. The Desky computer in the front. Uh, out of a lunar module and some other minutiae there. And I always brag about outside the Neil Armstrong Air and Space Museum in Wapakoneta, Ohio, is one of the best waffle houses that I've ever been in. So, and I always have me a nice waffle house meal when I'm there in Wapakoneta, Ohio. So uh, that's just a little, little extra side trip here on Stay Curious for Everybody as uh, we shared with you the great Apollo uh, uh, mission of Apollo 7 and astronaut Wally Schirra, Don Isley, and uh, uh, Cunningham. Uh, now Cunningham uh, is 91 years old uh, and uh, he was in the news not too long ago for having his storage unit robbed of some of the valuables he had in it. And uh, I think he was part of the uh, Marty, was he part of the, the Astronaut uh, Hall of Fame? Did he speak? That was Schweiker, not not uh, Cunningham. Was Cunningham part of that that talk they had about? Uh, I don't think he was. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, uh, Marty's got his signature on a couple things there, Cunningham, don't you? Yeah. So anyway, we appreciate everybody watching. Stay curious today, catching up with space history. Remember, we're going to have our Galaxy of Giving, as everybody has fundraisers going on, and we want you to save your money tax deductible for your favorite uh, charity, the, the the U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation, or maybe you want to become a member of the American Space Museum. We can fix you up with that uh, on our website. Karen Conklin will send you a, a beautiful certificate making you an honorary member uh, for uh, a year or more. Well, it's $25 a year, families are $40, and we have other sustainable type things on there, on there, because it's all about preserving this behind me. This is Cape Canaveral Gallery, all right, and the, all of this equipment was used. In fact, this equipment right here, a, a, a man walked up to it, all right, and told me that he worked on this machine. It was the Atlas pressurization machine to keep pressure in the Atlas rocket, all right, and uh, uh, Jim, uh, 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 oh, what, I, I knew I was going to miss his name when I started talking about him, had tears in his eyes, folks, looking at this machine. His 45-year-old son put his arm around him and said, what are you thinking about, Dad? And, and, and Dad said, I, I'm 27 years old. I loved everybody in this room. We were going to the moon, this gentleman told me. And, uh, oh, Bob, Ray, I, I'll think of it when I quit talking here in a minute he's on this picture right there okay and uh, uh uh and i hope to see him again in here this is how this museum affects the old timers here on the space coast when they see things that they worked with manuals that they launched with and so forth so um uh, we hope to see you in this museum and in, in this room soon so thank you selvin anything over there who we had watching today Yeah, Salvin, who's who's on the We have Dave Stangy, Doug Force, William Lighting, Gary Geriel, Neil Ten Thirty, Steve J, Tom Usiak, Cynthia Rossi, uh Larry Polskar and Pushkar. Yeah, Pushkar. I, see Larry I, I, I called him Baby. I missed him. 
And who? Carlton Bailey. Oh, Carlton Bailey there. Good, good. We're glad you all found us on YouTube. Uh, tell your friends they don't have to subscribe or anything uh, to get on there. And uh, uh, we, uh, we, that's how we monetize things a little bit, making uh, uh, not a lot of money, but we've got the, the pump prime there now for some dollars to flow in, thanks to YouTube and thanks to our IT uh, guy, Bruce Jacobs, for all that he's done. He's babied that YouTube for about four years until we were ready to uh, get on it with some quality programming like we hope we gave you today on Stay Curious. So tomorrow we've got Terry White, the manager of the Space Shuttle Orbital Processing Facilities. That's the guy with the handlebar mustache. So y'all going to love that. See Terry talk about hurricane preparations and writing out a hurricane or two. Uh, and then going out there as the first team to assess the damage. All of that on Stay Curious tomorrow. So I can't wait till I can see you here at the American Space Museum, and I can't wait to see you tomorrow to bridge the space between us. <laughs>